We're going to pick right up where we left off last week, uh, but before we do, let's kind of recap uh, what we discussed up to this point. Uh, the first week, um, we talked about faith, how faith is more than a belief. Uh, faith, our healthy faith, is actively exercised in a steadfast mindset with a proper perspective of purpose, of heart, in his faithfulness for his glory. Now, we cannot strive to meet God's standard of virtue in our own strength and power. God equips us with his Holy Spirit for a reason. God uses our strength. Uh, we, we are to use God's strength, not ours. If we do nothing, nothing will happen. Remember that, right? We can't just sit idle on that uh, starting line. We must be diligent, men. Regarding virtue, what's the standard? Is it our standard? Is it Gene's standard? No, it's God's standard. We remember that. Our character should align with God's word no matter what. No matter who's around or where we are. Knowledge is crucial for assurance of our faith. We talked about that. One of the last things we talked about is knowledge. It's uh, crucial for understanding of our faith and understanding of God's ways, his nature, his purpose, his will, and his character. And that leads us here tonight to verse 6. Verse 6 of 2 Peter 1, we're going to talk about self-control, perseverance, and godliness. Let's pick it up in uh, verse 5. But also, for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, in verse 6, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness. Now, self-control and perseverance, or you could kind of substitute in long-suffering for that, where else in the Bible uh, have we, can we find these virtues? All over the place, right? But in Galatians 5, what comes to mind for me, we'll pick it up in verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now, it doesn't say, but the fruit of Mike Dahl is love, joy, peace. No, it doesn't. It's the fruit of what? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Absolutely. Now, as we progress through the lesson this evening, let's keep this in mind. Let us not forget that we cannot rely on our own strength and power to become more virtuous. We are to rely on the strength and power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit alone. This brings us to self-control. Now, self-control involves discipline, restraint, and the ability to govern our thoughts, desires, and actions in alignment with God's will. And that's the key, alignment with God's will. See, self-control is a recurring theme in the Bible. Proverbs 25, 28 says, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. See, this analogy reveals the vulnerability and chaos that ensue when we lack self-control. Who remembers a story last week where I talked about my son? We talked about him. Those of you that were here, I talked about a story, and it was about how I found him listening to rap music, which he said was clean, but was not anything but clean. It was pretty, uh, pretty gnarly. So I found it, and I confiscated all his electronics, went in my office, figured out it was a lot worse than I originally suspected, found some text messages, and now I had to deal with it. So if you remember, one of the first things I did, one of the most important things I did was I paused. And what did I do? You remember? I prayed. I asked, I asked God to fill me with the Holy Spirit. I asked him to guide me on this one. Because if the God wasn't going to guide me on this one, I was probably going to walk out that door and put him in a guillotine or something. Everything in me wanted to go out there and just let him have it. All my flesh wanted to do it, but what I did is I prayed. I had patience. I waited till the next day to deal with it, to have that conversation with him that allowed the Holy Spirit to work in my heart, to work in my thoughts, in my actions. What if I had reacted with anger and emotion? What if I went out there and I just responded in the flesh? One of the biggest things that would have happened was my intended message, the message that was intended for him, he wouldn't have received it at all. All he would have heard is, is my mouth and what was coming out of it and how it was coming out, and he wouldn't have received what I was trying to teach him. 
Now, I have another story earlier on in my walk. It's had a much different outcome, and I handled it much differently, much differently. This was one maybe six, seven years ago. Kids are playing outside, outside my house on the street, and I'm inside, and in comes my girl. She comes running in, crying. The little girl cries. She started getting worked up a little bit. You know, you're, you're getting a little worked up. I'm like, man, this is my girl crying. What's going on? Dad, dad, dad. She's crying. I can barely hear what she's saying. She's like, Eli punched me in the face. I'm like, what? He punched me in the face. He started crying and going on and on and on. I'm like, I just went outside. I'm like, hold on a minute. Went outside, called him in. I'm like, Eli, get in here. And I didn't really... I asked him, I might ask him a question or two, but I wasn't listening to him at all. I marched his butt right upstairs, spanked him, put him in his room, left him there. Now, about 20 minutes later, I go back outside and I'm talking to the neighbor. All the kids are back out there playing. I let my girl go back out there and play. And he says, hey, is your daughter all right? Yeah, she's, she's okay. I said, I can't, believe, I can't believe that. I can't believe what happened to her. He's like, I'm sorry, dude. This is the neighbor. This is the adult, big guy. D played uh, football. I'm like, what do you mean, sorry? He's like, yeah, man. She, was, she I hit her in the face with the football. I was throwing the football to all the boys, and they were down there throwing. He was throwing 30 yard bombs, and she decided to go out there and jump in with the boys. And what happened? She gets hit, hit in the face with a football, and her brother's right there in the vicinity. Now she thinks her brother punched her in the face, but what really happened was not not that. She got hit in the face with a football. So here I am looking at him. I'm like, man, don't I feel like the village idiot right now? Seriously. And I felt horrible. Now, more importantly, my son up, upstairs in his room just got a butt whooping for nothing. Didn't do anything wrong. How do you think he feels? All right. We'll, we'll circle back to that. Let's talk about knowledge. How knowledge has a role in self-control. And that's why it precedes self-control. The knowledge self-control in this verse. James 1, no, sorry, excuse me. Um, well, knowledge gives us a greater awareness and sensitivity regarding areas where we struggle. And I wanted to make sure we hit that before we move on to James 1. Now, James 1, verse 19 through 20 says, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce righteousness of God. Now, I never heard of this verse at that time, but it was not too far past that I heard of this verse. It was in a Bible study. We started talking about this verse and breaking it down. And I'm thinking, wow. All I can think about is this incident. I go back and think about what, what was said, what was done, how this, that doesn't align. Whatever, who I am right now does not align with that verse. So I dug deeper, dug deeper. I got to know the verse. I got to start going from all over the Bible, wherever, wherever it took me. I started under having a better understanding of what God's will was for me, what, we were what I was supposed to do, who I was supposed to be in a scenario like that. See, my lack of self-control the day I disciplined my son impacted our relationship. And to this day, he still remembers it. As a matter of fact, I, I actually asked him, hey, do you remember this incident? He says, yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. I said, good, because I don't remember much of it. Can you tell me about it? <laughs> So he did, and because I've been telling him what, what I've been telling you guys here and explain it. I said, well, I, I, I dimed you out last week. Now it's my turn to make a fool of myself. So he was all happy about that. He's like, all right, payback. Anyway, long story short, our words and our actions, they have a huge impact on those around us. They have lasting impacts. You probably can remember words that somebody said to you a long time ago that still bother you to this day. It matters, gentlemen. It matters what comes out of our mouths. You know what? Since I'm on a roll, let's just keep talking about my idiocracy. Let's do this. Other areas where I struggle, where I have struggled in the past, where it's still on my mind, I'm still conscious about it. One is uh, profane speech. I used to cuss like a sailor, like a drunken sailor. Yeah, I, said, I saw Ray's head pop up. He's like, what? He's a retired sailor. I got to give it to him. They didn't say Marine. They say that's the, that's the term. It's, it's a drunken sailor. Hey, I'm just saying. But anyway, I used to cuss a lot. The Marine Corps, you know, I cussed before I went to the Marine Corps, but the Marine Corps got, you know, it's all we do. It's like an adjective. It's like a, 
Every, every other word's a, a four-letter word or whatever it is, but I cuss quite a bit. I asked God, I asked God for help. One day I said, God, I, I can't do this on my own. I need help. I need you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Guide me, help me, stop cussing because it's, it's bad. And it wasn't, it wasn't within like a week that I stopped cussing. It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy how fast it happened when I got out of my own way and let God do it. Leading up to that, some of the verses that kind of stood out for me, Colossians 3.8. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Another one, Ephesians 4.29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Here's the deal. I, I do cuss occasionally. I get mad. Sometimes I get angry, and I do throw a word out there from time to time. But it's more causal. It's more effect than it is causal now. Um, but it's not part of my life. It's not who I am. Fundamentally, God has changed me from there. You know, honestly, I'm, I'm hoping I don't drop an F-bomb right here, you know. That... No, I'm not, but it's one of the things where I could tell you that, that it's made a big impact in my life, and, and, and I know God's real because he does wonderful things, and, and for him to do that is just phenomenal. It's amazing. It changed my life. It changed the way I was viewed by others, and it changed the way I view my, my fate. Um, another one's lust. You know, at one point, I was heavily into pornography, very promiscuous behavior, the way I talked to other women. I can, I can remember literally taking pictures of my realtor's butt while we're going in houses when she's op opening up the key. That's, that's, it's crazy. This is back before I was saved. Some of the verses that spoke to me, Matthew 5.26, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in her, or with her in his heart. Man, that just hit me hard. That made me think a lot. Colossians 3, 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and coveting, which is idolatry. I'll ask you tonight, what areas of your life are you struggling with when it comes to self-control? Think about it. What are the areas that you're struggling with when it comes to self-control? And have you found the scripture that speaks to you? the scripture that God had intended just for you? It's a good question to ponder. This brings us to perseverance. Back to the verse. We'll kick it off in verse five. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, and this brings us to, to self-control perseverance. The perseverance is holding to a course of action, belief, or purpose without giving up or falling apart. The ability to remain loyal to faith and godliness in the faith, or sorry, in the face of great trials and opposition. Perseverance is a continuation of self-control. That's why it comes after it. It enables us to remain faithful to God's purposes, even in difficult times. It involves staying steadfast, and continuing to pursue God's purpose despite challenges, setbacks, and disappointments. Now, let's talk about the Biosphere 2. Have you ever heard about the Biosphere 2? It's in Arizona. Anyway, I think they have a picture of it up on the screen. It's a three-acre controlled environment that researchers use for various projects. Now, this uh, giant structure, it contains a variety of environments, including a rainforest, savanna, desert, and even an ocean. Not huge, but it, but it has the simulation for all these environments inside of it. The idea is if it to be self-sustaining. Now, these different environments were created. When they were created, the researchers, they made an interesting uh, discovery. They found something that was very interesting that happened that they weren't expecting. See, they planted various trees, all kinds of different types of trees, and they found that in this perfect environment, the trees grew very fast faster than they, than they do in the wild. 
However, before the trees reached their full size, many of them toppled over and they began to lean. They started leaning over or they just fell completely over. Now the researchers, they couldn't figure out what was happening until somebody with a 10 pound head said, I've got it. What do you think it, what do you think it was? There you go. Lack of wind, there was no wind. They're thinking, no wind, How's, what's that have to do with anything, right? Well, the presence of wind, see, it makes the trees grow stronger for a couple reasons. What happens is when, when the wind hits it, it stresses the tree and they grow deeper roots. And they also grow, they produce something called reaction wood. And what that does, it makes it stronger, more flexible at the same time, and it fills in all the cracks and all the things that are going on with the tree. It basically puts this reaction wood where it's needed, and it makes the tree resilient to wind. In other words, the trees need to experience the stress of wind, or they will not be prepared to endure the storms to come and to reach full maturity. So you see, what God shows us in nature, it applies to us as well. It applies to us, gentlemen. If God is doing it with his trees, he's going to do it with man who was made in his image. See, God is the master designer, and we are his most precious design. We too must endure the winds so that our faith is deeply rooted, and we are prepared to weather the storms to come. Now, these winds, they come in the form of trials and tribulations. James 1, verse 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Maybe some of you tonight are going through a difficult time. You're being tested right now. You're facing maybe a challenging situation as we speak, as you sit in this room. See, God wants to make us mature and complete, not to keep us from all pain. We should see our struggles as opportunities, opportunities for growth. I'll say that again. We should see our struggles as opportunities for growth. Back when I, in 1999, when Lassie was a pup, I was a, a drill instructor. I got down there, went through DI school, I think it was, was it April 99. Graduated there, went on to my, my training company, where I trained for three years. Um, talk about recruit training. Talk about what recruits go through and how we build Marines. You see, the first thing we do is we, we instill a great fear and stress. In them. And you could see, you've probably seen that for some of the videos, some of the movies, through intimidation, excessive noise and chaos. We used to count them down to be online. So we'd tell them to go do something. And then they had to be online in a position of attention, every single one of them, and done whatever they had to do in a certain amount of time. And we'd always make the time just short enough where they couldn't make it. So they'd fail over and over again, and then they'd be punished for it. We also turned the recruits against each other. Psychological warfare, we, learned, we taught them, or we, we were able to use recruits to our advantage, not only four or five drill instructors, but now recruits are mad at you. So we got them to turn against each other. We also planted seeds of doubt constantly. You're not gonna make it. You suck. You shouldn't be here. You will never graduate. You'll never be a Marine. You're gonna fail. You're nothing. Constant seeds of doubt. Just like the devil, right? Just like the devil. Create pain and discomfort, fatigue, their physical training. We get them out there, we push them to their limits. We push them to their breaking points. We had uh, something called a pit. It was a sand box, big box of sand. We get them in there, we push them. We do all kinds of exercises. They had sand all over them. They were miserable in the heat with the sand fleas. Absolute chaos in a sandbox. It's not what they envisioned. We also had uniformity. Everything was uniform. Their uniforms were the same. Their gear was the same. The squad bay, when you walked in, everything was aligned. Everything was exactly the same, no matter where you looked. Even the way they spoke was the same. They had no individuality. 
Everything was all about the same, being the same. Worthless, you're all worthlessly the same. Now, everything we did had a purpose. Every single thing we did down there had a purpose, from the childhood to the way they walk, talk, eat. No matter what it was, it had a purpose. I'll give you an example. Recruits are standing in formation. If I'm sitting there and they're standing at the position of attention in formation, they don't move or they don't talk. I'd walk past. I'd go be walking out to the formation. They'd get out there first, run out of the squad bay. I'd walk past, and I'd look at the corner of my eye and see some little recruit go, eeky, eeky, eeky reach up and grab his little ear and itch that little sand flea, immediately down on your face. Recruit so-and-so wants to itch his face, everyone down. They'd be in the, they'd be in the push-up position. They'd be holding themselves up there waiting for me to say the next command. I'd, tell them what the, I'd say, what the mind fails to comprehend, they would say, the body must be punished. I'd say, whose body? They go, everybody. And I'd go, down, pain. They go, up. I'd go, up. They'd say, discipline. And they do it over and over again until I almost got them to the breaking point. So I made them real miserable. Then some recruit would be over there cheating. Oh, recruit so and so is cheating. Good, we'll do more. And we kept doing it. That seems kind of unfair, doesn't it? One recruit goes eeky, eeky, like that, and everybody pays. No, I think it's perfectly fair, and I'll tell you why. Say you're in a, say you're in a defensive position and you're holding down inside of a, a building or a street. You're sitting there, you're waiting. Here comes the enemy rolling up the street exactly where you wanted them to go. Now some recruit undisciplined over there decides to cough. A recruit so-and-so wants to move, he knocks over a vase inside of a house. Now they turn the attack on us. Now they're coming at us, they know we're there. Does he suffer alone? No. You know who suffers? Everybody. Everybody. Now we start seeing growth. As we went on, they're getting closer to graduation. They're starting to, they're starting to grow. Their attitudes, their confidence, their pride. These recruits, they no longer had to. They want to now. They want to. They want to look good. They want to blouse their boots. They want to make sure their gear's right. They're starting to take pride in what they do. They're starting to persevere. They're persevering at this point. Their physical and mental thresholds are improving. They could take a lot of pain mentally and physically now. They're starting to use teamwork. They're no longer yelling at each other. They're helping each other, grabbing their gear. They're grabbing whatever they can. They're holding their pack for them because they can't handle it. They're taking care of each other. After 13 weeks of hell on earth, they possess the virtues of a Marine now. They're just like us. We've accomplished our mission through pain, misery, through trials and tribulations. Did these recruits understand the purpose behind everything we did? Nope, they didn't have a clue. Not one clue. Just like we don't fully understand how God is using trials and tribulations in our lives to teach us how to persevere. It's no different. Like those recruits, I trust God. I trust God, just like those recruits trusted us drill instructors. He knows what he's doing, gentlemen. This leads us to godliness, to perseverance, godliness. For those of us here tonight who have been saved, we've been saved for a purpose. The purpose is for reconciling our relationship with a living God. The result of that relationship with God is the outpouring of godliness in our lives. Well, what is godliness? Let's explore that tonight. Now, before I tell you what godliness is, I'm going to tell you what it's not. That way, if you know what it's not, it's easier for you to understand what it is. 2 Timothy says 3, sorry, uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 5 says, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. See, Paul here is talking about a form of godliness. It's a form of godliness. Something that looks like it, but it isn't it. It's not it. We can look godly, but have no substance at the same time. David Guzik says, in our self-obsessed world, people feel very free to have a salad bar religion. They pick and choose what they want. They feel free to be very spiritual, 
but no sense of obligation to be biblical. See, religion gives the impression of something related to God that's real. See, we could look religious, we could wear religious clothes, we could use religious vocabulary, we could speak Christianese. Oh yeah. We could carry a religious book too, the Bible. We could hang out with religious people, and yet there be no power. Some of us know what this is. Some of us know what this is to go to church for years and not be changed. I could tell you that I went to school, I went to church for 10 years with my wife after she was saved and I wasn't changed. I wasn't there for Christ. I wasn't there for anything. I was just there, unchanged. Going to church in and of itself will not make us more godly. It's like going to a garage will not have the power to turn us into a car. It's just not going to happen, gentlemen. So what is godliness? Let's make a transition. The word godliness comes from an old English word called godlikeness. It means to have the character and attitude of God. In other words, godliness is a lifestyle that constantly reflects the character of God. I'll say that again. Godliness is a lifestyle that constantly reflects the character of God, which can only be achieved if led by what? The Holy Spirit, exactly. See, godliness means that I'm living my life in the light of God's presence. People are not experiencing more God because they don't live in his presence all the time. They just visit. They visit on Sunday mornings when they go to church, do their little Christianese wave. Hey, how everybody doing? That's why I love parking. I don't know if I've told you this before. I love parking because I could see what's going on before they step out of the car. They're sitting there brawling and fighting and being nasty, and then they get out of the car like, hey, how you doing, Mike? Nice to see you. God bless you. Good stuff, good stuff. The godly person is obsessed with God's presence. They're obsessed with pleasing God because they're ever conscious of where he is, consistently evaluating things from his perspective. They're constantly reflecting on him, thus reflecting him. Although the Holy Spirit equips us and produces godliness, progress in godliness is, is not automatic. It's not. Charles Swindle says, so you want to be like God? Well, me too. But, but that kind of godliness won't just happen by hanging around the church or thinking lofty thoughts three or four times a day or learning a few verses of Scripture. It will take more, much more. Disciplining ourselves will require the same kind of focused thinking and living that our master modeled during his brief life on earth. Being godly requires action. But remember, godliness can only be achieved in Christ. It's a very, it's a delicate balance. Action's not you taking action, you doing it, trying harder, doing better. Action is looking upwards first. That's your first action. Paul writes in 1 Timothy, sorry, 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Training ourselves to be godly is spiritual. I say that again. Training ourselves to be godly is spiritual. It's not physical. And the weapons of warfare are not carnal. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, bring every thought captive, sorry, bring every thought into captivity to obedience of Christ. You see, to battle against carnal way of thinking and doing, our thoughts must be brought captive and made obedient to Christ. Gentlemen, when we start to think in this cardinal way, which we do often, which you will do, maybe after you walk here, maybe, maybe right now, we must stop our thoughts, take dominion over them in Jesus, and not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. As we close tonight, gentlemen, I want to leave you with a few points, a few things to ponder, a few things to think about. Exercising self-control is so important. 
It allows us to reflect God's nature, ensuring our messages are received in the same way that we intended. When God challenges us with trials and tribulations, remember, he is using these moments to prepare us for the storms that lie ahead. Gentlemen, we will persevere. We will persevere in Christ. And lastly, godliness requires a continuous surrender to God's Holy Spirit. As he guides us, empowers us to live a lifestyle that consistently reflects his character. Thank you, gentlemen.